trust and obey that God will do the things he said he would do, that God is doing things you don't know about, and that God is doing things in the future that you don't know about. And uh, we just finished our study in Hebrews, and we learned even more colors to that definition of faith and how it, how it's growing and how it's changing with us. Um, and that trust, you know, that trust, we are just to believe and to trust even when things are hard or bad or tough. You know, because bad things, God doesn't do bad things to us, right? He doesn't do bad things to us because nothing bad can come from God. Um, nothing bad can come from God. So anything bad that's going on in your life, I wouldn't say that God's doing this to me because God doesn't do bad things to you. He's always working towards the good of you and the good of everyone. Good stuff is all that comes from God, the Father of heavenly lights. And so if you want to test your faith, because with the testing of faith comes perseverance, right? If you want to test your faith, go through some bad stuff, and you will learn to call upon the Lord and to trust Him and obey Him no matter what's going on. within your name for this we know this we know you promise never to forsake what you began you will sustain for this we know this we know I will call strong enough to save. Rise, your shackles are no more, for Jesus Christ has broken every chain. name will break every stronghold. Freedom is ours when we call his name. Jesus' name above every other. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Jesus' name will Jesus' name.
Thank you, Jason. After the last couple of weeks uh, in, in children's camp, I don't know if you have the strength to sing something like that. <laughs> well, turn with me, please, to Job chapter 11. Job chapter 11. While you're doing that, I want to say uh, that it's good to have Jennifer back with us. She just got back this week from Romania, 10 days over there. Uh, Mainly, I'm sure you did more than just this, but mainly helping people find eyeglasses that would that would fit them and work with them. Um, and uh, we we're going to get with you and set up a time when you can give us a report on that. And uh, also, it's good to have Miss Margaret here with us today. Uh, and she had a really good birthday party this past Sunday and uh, past Tuesday, and uh, uh, good turnout for that. And uh, it's just so so good to have you back with us today. And that guy that brought you too, we're glad he's with you also. <laughs> Job chapter eleven. We're going to read three verses. 7, 8, and 9. Would you stand with me, please, in honor of God's Word? Today, we're talking about when you can't understand God. Can you fathom the mysteries of God? Can you probe the limits of the Almighty? They are higher than the heavens. What can you do? They are deeper than the depths of the grave. What can you know? Their measure is longer than the earth and wider than the sea. Thank you. you may be seated. You know, there's a lot of things I don't understand. For example, I don't understand how I can press the letter A on my computer keyboard and the image of the letter A appears on my monitor. I don't understand how that happens. Particularly uh, if, if the uh, keyboard is wireless. Wirelessly it transmits a signal to the computer and the computer wirelessly transmits a signal to the, to the monitor and says put the letter A on the screen. I don't understand how that happens. I don't understand how just the right combination of hydrogen and oxygen make water. It makes no sense to me how I can watch a baseball game on my television set in my living room, which is being beamed from a satellite hundreds of miles in space to a little receiver on the, mounted to the roof that's just a little bit bigger than a platter. I don't understand how that happens. Well, sometimes I don't understand God either. God is a mystery. Sometimes we just can't figure him out. God is sometimes very difficult to understand. Those words that we just read from Job chapter 11 kind of emphasize that. Can you fathom the mysteries of God? Can you probe the limits of the Almighty? But a little bit later, Job chapter 37 verse 5, we read that God's voice thunders in marvelous ways. He does great things beyond our understanding. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, we read this. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the hearts of men, yet they cannot fathom what God has done from the beginning to the end. Just beyond us. We find beautiful words in Isaiah chapter 40. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. Near the end of his letter to the Roman Christians, Paul broke out in praise when he wrote, Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. All of those are just other ways of saying sometimes we just can't understand what God's doing. We can't understand him. We don't understand his purpose. We don't understand what he's, what's, what's he doing. Where's he going with this? 
The scripture tells us, though, that, that God is a God we can know. And, and yet there are aspects of God, his, his ways, his, his nature, that we cannot know. Proverbs 5, verse 2 reads, It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. We read in the book of Isaiah, Truly you are a God who hides himself. And then later in Isaiah, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And we're told bluntly in Ecclesiastes 11, 5, as you do not know the path of the wind or how a body is formed in a mother's womb, so you cannot understand the work of God, the maker of all things. So when we say we can't understand God sometimes, we're not, I mean, we're not being blasphemous. That's exactly what the Bible says will happen. We cannot understand the work of God. We mortals sometimes cannot figure out what God is up to, and sometimes it might even appear to us he's not even paying attention. The movement of his hand is sometimes so slow as to be indiscernible to us. And sometimes his hand moves in our lives with frightening speed. Sometimes his hand gently caresses, and sometimes his hand strikes us with a stunning blow. And yet, God is hard to understand. The things he does and why he does them and what he allows to happen and how he does them many times are shrouded in mystery. Paul once said, now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Or as the King James puts it, sometimes we see through a glass darkly. And sometimes we don't even see or understand that well. We have a lot of unanswered questions about God, don't we? Sometimes, sometimes you'll get in a conversation with somebody about something and it'll be, it'll be some difficult something that doesn't seem to have any answer or solution and we'll say, well, I don't know, but when I get to heaven, that's one of the first things I'm going to ask God. You know, haven't you said that? For instance, we can reach back a few years and we can ask, why did God allow so much death and destruction when Hurricane Katrina came ashore? Why are so many Christians, innocent believers, losing their lives in other parts of the world just because they're a follower of Christ? Why does he allow that? Why do people who have no room for God in their lives seem to prosper while righteous people sometimes have a very difficult time of just getting it through the day. Sometimes barely making ends meet. Why do good people sometimes die young? When life becomes something resembling an out of control monster, we might sit in numbed shock. Our minds and our hearts are filled with questions. All kinds of questions. And sometimes the loads that we carry make our waking hours long and heavy. And the nights are longer and heavier still. The song in our hearts seems to have been stilled. And when Thanksgiving arrives on the calendar, we might even find ourselves saying, what is there to be thankful for? You've heard me mention C.S. Lewis, Englishman, a professor, uh, may have been the greatest Christian thinker, apologist of the 20th century. He's the one who wrote the Chronicles of Narnia, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. 
He wrote a lot of other wonderful Christian classics of literature. But C.S. Lewis did not get married until he was 58 years old. 58 years old. Her name was Joy Gresham, an American divorcee. And he loved Joy with all his heart. I mean, he, he waited 58 years to, be, to get married, and when he got married, he threw himself into it with all of his might. But after they had been married only four years, Joy died of cancer. And that heart that he had given to her so freely was broken into a thousand pieces. Well, he wrote a book about that experience, more for his own therapy than anything else, I'm sure. But the book is called A Grief Observed. A Grief Observed. And even though he was a committed Christian, Lewis still struggled with crushing grief. And he expressed his doubts with these stunning words. I want you to listen to this. This is a Christian, a committed Christian thinker who wrote these words. Meanwhile, where is God? This is one of the most disquieting symptoms. When you are happy, so happy that you have no sense of needing him, if you turn to him with praise, you'll be welcomed with open arms. But go to him when your need is desperate, when all other help is vain, and what do you find? A door slammed in your face and a sound of bolting and double bolting on the inside. After that, silence. You may as well turn away. Now, many of us self-righteous Christians hear that and we think Lewis was turning away from God because of his grief. And if that's all you were to hear from that particular book, that's exactly what you would think. That's the conclusion we would come to. But the opposite is true. He was simply being honest. He expressed the very things that a lot of us have thought ourselves at times. Let's, let's admit it. But then he wrote something else. You never know how much you really believe anything until its truth or falsehood becomes a matter of life and death. It is easy to say you believe a rope to be strong as long as you are merely using it to cord a box. Remember, he's English. But suppose you had to hang by that rope over a precipice. Wouldn't you then first discover how much you really trusted it? And he was saying there that while he had been talking and writing about God and believing in God and teaching about God and lecturing about God and so forth, that his experience with grief had left him wrestling with whether or not he really did trust God after all, like he said he did. Grief does that to us. And I'm not just talking about grief when someone you love dies. Grief can occur in our, in our lives for a wide variety of reasons. It could be the loss of a loved one. It could be the loss of a job, a divorce, maybe your own or somebody close to you. Or, or just because we're getting older and life isn't what it once was or what we thought it would be. We can grieve over that. When I was the pastor of a church in South Jackson, we were, uh, a, lot of, a lot of the older people in the church were grieving because their neighborhoods had changed and crime had moved in and things just weren't like they used to be. And they were grieving over that. Well, I believe, and I think about our congregation, and I think about the various things that different people are going through. I, I believe this is a message that we all need to hear. But even if you don't need to hear it, I need to hear it. I believe that God's given us this message for his people at this time. When we can't understand God, 
there are some things we need to do some things we need to know first of all when we can't understand God we need to grieve and when things happen in your life that you didn't plan they sneaked up from behind you and slapped you upside the head and hurt you badly you need to grieve You know, there's nothing especially spiritual or righteous about denying the pain and the grief that we feel. It doesn't make you a super Christian for you to say everything's okay when it's not. God created us with the ability to love, and every one of us loves someone or some, you know, somebody one way or another. And when something happens to take that person away from us, or when, a, when, when the job that we've invested ourselves in for years and years and years suddenly isn't there, either because we were laid off, or the business closed, or we retired, it's normal for us to grieve. As we get older and things are just not what they used to be, it's normal for us to grieve. As we look back on our lives and we miss people who have gone on before of us before us a long time before, it's normal for us to grieve. You search high and low in the scriptures and you will not find it written anywhere that God tells us it is wrong to grieve. And to the contrary, Jesus himself said in his Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. So this capacity to grieve is a normal, I don't know what, they would cut in and out only um, Sunday night too. The capacity to grieve is a normal, God-given ability that helps us to sort through loss and pain. It's something that we should do and we need to do. We never completely get over those losses and that's okay. But secondly, we need to trust God. As difficult as that is. Many times we can't understand what God's doing, but it becomes even more important then than ever that we learn to trust Him. Sometimes Satan tries to use our pain to get us to turn away from God or to feel that God's picking on us. But unless we grieve properly... That can certainly happen to us. But while the scriptures are clear that we cannot fully comprehend the workings of God in our lives, it's also clear that we can trust Him. For example, Proverbs 3 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding. And that verse teaches us a powerful truth and that, that, that there are times when we simply are not going to understand what God's doing or what is happening, but we can trust Him. And there are others. Oh gosh, there are so many others. I just want to fortify this statement with just a couple, uh, uh, three of them. Psalm 56, 3, when I am afraid, I will trust in you. Isaiah 30, 15, in repentance and rest is your salvation, in quietness and trust is your strength. John 14, 1, Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. And he told them that at the very beginning of the most difficult night of their lives, at the beginning of the most difficult life in the li uh, night and day in the life of Christ, just before he was arrested, beaten, tried, beaten some more, crucified. Trust in God. Dr. James Dobson, who founded Focus on the Family, wrote a book a few years ago uh, after several of his closest friends died tragically in a plane crash. In fact, these, these men were members of the board of Focus on the Family. And they had been to a board meeting and they were flying away in the plane crash. And they all died. 
And he called that book, When God Doesn't Make Sense. And, and listen, I, I, don't know if, I don't know if the book is still in print. I would be surprised if it isn't, but I recommend it. I, I recommend it for anybody who ever struggles with why we go through difficulty. He wrote in his book some pretty hard words, but they are true and they are powerful. This is what he wrote. My concern is that many believers apparently feel God owes them smooth sailing or at least a full explanation and perhaps an apology for the hardships they encounter. We must never forget that He, after all, is God. He is majestic and holy and sovereign. He is accountable to no one. He is not an errand boy who chases the assignments that we dole out. He is not a genie who pops out of the bottle to satisfy our whims. He is not our servant. We are His. And our reason for existence is to glorify and honor Him. Even so, sometimes He performs mighty miracles on our behalf. Sometimes He chooses to explain His action in our lives. Sometimes His presence is as real as if we had encountered Him face to face. But at other times, when nothing makes sense, when what we are going through is not fair, when we feel all alone in God's waiting room, He simply says, trust me. Sometimes that's all we have to go on, isn't it? When we can't understand what God is doing, we must trust Him. It becomes more important then than ever before. Number three, we need to know that God is not offended by our questions. He's not offended by our questions. Some say we're not supposed to question God, but I heartily disagree. We just need to look at the scriptures to, to find out that that's not true. At one point, Moses was extremely frustrated with the way that things were going as he's trying to lead the people out of Egypt and take them to the land of promise. God's apparent lack of attention to what was happening to them just got him so frustrated. So Moses cried out, O oh Lord, why have you brought trouble upon this people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he's brought trouble upon this people and you have not rescued your people at all. So not just questions, accusing questions. King David certainly went through some very difficult times in his life. Some of them were of his own making, just like us. But many of them were not, just like us. Once he cried out, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? In Psalm 77, David again was questioning God. He said, will the Lord reject me for forever? Will he never show his favor again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Even Jesus, while dying on the cross for us, questioned God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But listen, folks, God was not offended by those questions. And he's not offended by ours. You see, God is big enough to handle any of the questions or any of the accusations we may have or throw against Him about His, about Him, His ways, or His, His purpose in our lives. The question that we most often ask is, why? And I think it's okay to ask that question, but we need to be honest with ourselves and with God to know that sometimes there just may not be an answer to that particular question. We may not know why a particular thing has happened until we reach eternity. In the meantime, it's perfectly normal, it's perfectly healthy to question God's dealings in our lives. It may be that there is a truth that we cannot know or an aspect of our character that we cannot have until we have been through the valley 
and ask some of those questions. Number four. This, is this one on? I don't know what's going on with this. I'm going to turn this one off. We'll just deal with this. Number four. We need to know that we don't have to know all the answers. Like, why the sound system doesn't work sometimes. We don't have to know all the answers. It's okay for us to say, I don't know. Perfectly all right for us to admit that there are just some things we cannot know. And it's, it's pointless to continue to try to figure it out. When God says, be still and know that I am God, he, He's saying to us that we need to quit our striving and struggling and just rest in Him. We don't come together today to find out what the answers are. I, anybody who claims to know all the answers is just proving he doesn't know all the questions. We don't know all the answers, and that's okay. But then number five, and this is so important, this, this one may be, this is all of it together. We need to know that this is not all there is. Have you ever you ever thought about, you know, when you get to heaven, the people that you're going to want to see? Family members and maybe some characters out of the Bible or, you know, and I've told you a few times that <clears throat> I've already asked the Lord if when I get to heaven that I can sing a duet with Tennessee Ernie Ford. <laughs> but there are other people, there are people that I want to see. And not just people I knew here. There are some people I want to meet. And one of those is named Vance Habner. Vance Habner was a long-time Southern Baptist evangelist uh, from South Carolina. He was married for 33 years to his precious Sarah. And he wrote a book entitled, Though I Walk Through the Valley. And in that book, he shares the hope that he and all believers have in Christ. He talked about how Sarah was gone. He talked about, he named a few things that he loved about her and to quote him, the thousand precious other things that he enjoyed so much about her. He found himself saying under his breath over and over, Sarah is gone. Sarah is gone. But then he writes this, but God is not gone. This blessed book is not gone. The Holy Spirit called alongside to help is not gone. And Jesus is here. After all, we know where Sarah is. Just a little farther along, just over the border. And what business has an old septuagenarian talking about himself, now three score and twelve, moaning when he himself can't possibly be around much longer? Anybody that near to the next world, that close to heaven, need not lament as though a lifetime lay between him and his destination. This little boot camp, that's what he called life, this little boot camp is just about over. This internship is almost past, and his servants shall serve him there. Sarah has just been promoted to a higher grade, and I stand in line and not far down that line. She has just gone, and I am going. And then Vance Havner exclaims, One of these days the picture will change. What is gone will be present, and what is so present now will have disappeared. We will have joined our loved ones again and forever. Where will tears be then? Gone. For God will have wiped them away. What happened to death? Gone. What about sorrow? Gone. And crying? Gone. And what happened to pain, that old companion of these days? Gone. Listen to what the scriptures say. 
from the last book of the scriptures, the revelation that God gave to John. And this is what John said he saw as a prophecy of what is to come. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there's no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. We may not always understand God. But that's okay. Over time we find ourselves moving from constant and searing heartache to a fresh realization of hope. It will come even even though in the meantime the hurt is deep and the pain is fresh. Over time we move from helpless despair to refreshing hope. In the meantime, those of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior can look forward to that moment when we step over to the other side of eternity. A person, I don't know whether male or female, by the name of L. Nathan wrote this. It's entitled, Someday We'll Understand. Not now, but in the coming years, it may be in the better land. We'll read the meaning of our tears, and someday, there, we'll understand. We'll catch the broken threads again and finish what here we began. Heaven shall the mysteries explain, and then, ah, then, we'll understand. God knows the way. He holds the key. He guides us with unerring hand. Sometime with tearless eyes we'll see. Yes, there, up there, we'll understand. Then trust in God through all your ways, all your days. Fear not, for He holds your hand. Though dark the way, still sing and pray. Sometime, someday, We'll understand. Let's pray together. Father, there's probably not a single one of us in this room who's never asked the question, why? Who's never looked to you during times of hurt and grief and unbearable pain and asked you, why? And yet somehow, Lord, you've given us the strength to keep going. Somehow, you provided the resources that we need to put one foot in front of the other and keep going. Perhaps someone here today is going through that very thing right now, Lord. What it looks like for them looks different than it does for me, but still just as real and still just as in need of your help. Some of us are grieving over something that happened years ago. Perhaps it was only yesterday. I pray that your Holy Spirit, the Comforter, Jesus called him, will move among us today and comfort us. 
Lord, I pray if there's somebody here today who needs to make some type of commitment to you, who needs to surrender more completely to you, who needs to know that you're walking with them, who, who says, I, I can't do this on my own. I'm asking for the Lord to help me. Lord, give them the courage to say so, to admit it to themselves, and to profess Jesus in front of others. I thank you, Lord, for walking with us and being with us in the days ahead. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you come as we stand? Thank you so much for being here today. Um, Tyler, will you and Kirsten stand up right here, please? Kirsten's down here for moral support. But Tyler Blair, Friday night, came to know Jesus as his personal Savior. And he's presenting himself to uh, us uh, for membership and for baptism. Do you join me in welcoming him into the kingdom of God? Huh? Amen. Amen. Now, next Sunday, uh, we have, uh, there were some uh, folks I was going to, I was trying to baptize before I left, before I was gone to be with Sharon, and we had some real bad weather and some other things happened, and uh, so anyway, uh, we are going to uh, baptize six, devil, you're not going to do this. <laughs> We are going to baptize six people next Sunday. All right. I'm telling you about baptizing six people and the, and the sound system cut out right then. You tell me there's not a demon in our sound system. 